well, they're absurd, but they're also paradoxes. Mm. Uh, it's a logical paradox, and it's it's meant to to put the mind into a feedback loop that generates a certain kind of feeling, mm. which comes from trying to contemplate something that has an inherent contradiction in it. Uh, and what is the contradiction of this Zen philosophy? Is that they say that nothing is something. How is that? Because they say that everything has come from nothing. Exactly right, Neville. Like I got this. it. Huh? It's like this. <laughs> yeah, he just... Um, Florian just handed me a card with a, with a drawing on it of a box. And inside the box it says, This box is empty. Oh, very zen. <laughs> You know, that's the same thing as, this statement is a lie, mm -hmm. right? It's a self-contradicting paradoxical statement to say that everything comes from nothing. Nothing is the absolute. So everything comes from nothing and then it goes back into nothing. Yeah? And of course there's no proof for this because no one has ever seen nothing, nor can they see it. And yeah, it's right. Peter says it's designed to turn your brain into jello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It because it short circuits all the reasoning. Huh? If there's no reasoning, if there's no discursive thought, the Zen Buddhists say that uh, you read, you have kensho, you have some enlightenment experience. But actually. What, all that's happening is that they're sitting without bringing in the mind and their, their energy, their life energy, is moving according to its own intelligence. That's all. That's all that this is all about. It's just that you sit there and you don't think, you just observe and you allow your energy to move because most people are uh, using their mind to, um, how can I say, interfere with the natural flow of energy in their bodies. Uh, any, any massage therapist, any uh, martial artist, anybody who works with energy can understand this. <laughs> Uddhava just posted this cartoon. Oh, we have to uh, change the tapes. And, uh, but anyway, once you get your mind out of the way of your natural life energy, then it moves in its own way and you feel so much better. So that's very nice, but let's not confuse that with spiritual enlightenment. Mm -hmm. huh? That's something completely different. Yeah, that's why the, the Zen people meditate on the Dantian, which is the uh, second chakra, just below the belly button, just below the navel, because that is the, uh, like the reservoir, like the storage battery of the uh, chi, or uh, prana in the body. So it's just prana, that's all. Yeah, that's right, Neville. Neville says, materialists say, Look, random forces of nature make beautiful mountains and natural formations. Surely they can also make animals and humans given enough time. But the forces of nature are not random. They also have the super soul supreme consciousness behind them. So there's no randomness in anything. That's right. The supreme lord enters into the creation as the super soul. And he's within every atom. But here's a question to ask scientists. How are the laws of nature enforced? Huh? What makes the atoms, what makes an atom of carbon have four uh, links, atomic links, and what makes an atom of hydrogen have only one? Why do the different chemicals connect the way they do into compounds? 
Why do the different sub subatomic particles act the way they do? All they can say is, well, we have observed in the laboratory that, that such and such happens. Right. Yeah. How does dumb matter obey laws? Well, obviously something has to force it because matter doesn't have any intelligence by itself. There has to be an enforcer. Huh? So that's God. God, as the super soul, enters within every atom, as stated in the scripture. But what does that mean? That means that he is in control of all the transformations and reactions of material nature. It's not random. It's not accidental. It's all very, very deliberate. So we can understand that without this intelligence, the material creation is impossible. It doesn't just arise out of nothing. We never see an example in real life of something coming from nothing. What we do see is that matter is always conserved. Matter and energy in its complementary forms are always conserved and that one thing is transformed into another thing by the laws of nature. Yeah, so if you ask any scientist this question, they cannot answer. Just like they cannot answer, well, even if we accept the Big Bang, where is the energy of the Big Bang coming from? And if you say, well, there was some kind of subatomic reaction or something like that, then you still have to answer the question, who determines the laws of nature that cause that subatomic reaction? That energy, that intelligence has to come from someplace. It can't come from no place, like the Zen people say. Huh? There's really more in common between the Zen people and the modern scientists than there is between either of them and the Vedic theory. Even if you look at uh, religious scriptures like the Bible, they miss this point completely. Somehow or other, they accept that God is the cause of the material creation. But they still are so naive about matter that they think that matter can somehow arrange itself. Until very recently, actually uh, it started back in the time of the ancient Greeks, people thought that, for example, flies, maggots, which are the larvae of flies, were a natural product of the uh, spoiling of food. They thought that as, as the food broke down, they would naturally release maggots and other insects and bacteria. Aristotle was that. Was that was Aristotle? That was Aristotle. Good old Aristotle. And he was the one who, who gave the whole uh, logic system to Christian philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, his logic was obviously flawed. And then there's another one. Another uh, example that, for example, water, if you boil it, it disappears. <laughs> or a candle. Oh, here's, yeah, this one is even used by the Zen guys. The they say, if you burn a candle, it disappears into nothingness. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Of course, now, actually, we know that when you burn a candle, some of the mass is transformed into gas and some of it is transformed into light energy. Uh, but actually, all of the ingredients of the candle are conserved. They're simply transformed into other forms. That's all. That's the first law of thermodynamics. What's that? The first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics, Florian says. So, and what's the second law? Well, <clears throat> the, the law of entropy. Entropy, which says that a complex system will, over time, degenerate into a more simple state. Uh, why? Because complexity and information require energy. The only exception to that is, is that if the system is an open system... Come here and okay. talk. Otherwise there I have is, to repeat it. There is only one, because then you could say, okay, um, there is an exception. What is about open systems? Because we can observe in every closed system that this law 
um, is, uh, is valid. We don't have any uh, example in the material world where this law doesn't work, except for open systems. So well, another open evolution systems, is open systems means there's something more than the material world. Well, no. In the there, there are some there are well in the logical sense if you break it down it would be that. But there are some some open systems in the material world. But the evolutionists say the Earth is an open system because it absorbs the light energy and the emission of the sun. Well, <coughs> that's true. That is true. But but the light energy of the sun and the radiation of the sun is all but constructive. It is destructive, and we can observe that in every in every uh, every angle. And this kind of proposed open system doesn't meet the criteria of an open system in physics. It's simply it's it's uh, well it um, 